Uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming tonight. Happy World Oceans Day. Uh, my name is Jonathan. I'm the manager of public programs here at the Vancouver Aquarium. Our mission is to conserve aquatic life. For those of you that are in the audience, just a couple of reminders. Uh, one, if you have an electronic device, to please turn it off. Uh, we can't have food and drinks in the theater either. And we will have a question and answer period at the end of the presentations. And I will come around with this microphone and hold it out for you to ask your question. So uh, I won't be relinquishing any control of the microphone though, just so that you know. Okay. Uh, good evening and thank you for coming tonight. Uh, our presentation tonight is on protecting BC's marine mammals from land-based pollution. Uh, 15 years ago, we learned that BC's killer whales were some of the most contaminated marine mammals in the world. We also learned that these contaminants came from us. So today, are we doing a better job at protecting our killer whales? Is there technology that can help us clean up our act? Tonight, we have two speakers that are gonna help us answer these questions. Dr. Peter Ross, the director of the Ocean Pollution Program at the Vancouver Aquarium, will be speaking. He's been studying killer whales, the effects of contaminants on killer whales, beluga whales, sea otters, seals, salmon, and many other sea creatures. He's considered an international expert on marine pollution. We also have Dr. Hans Schreier, who's a professor uh, and faculty member in the Faculty of Land and Food Systems at the University of British Columbia. He studies watershed management, stormwater management, land water interactions, soil and water pollution, and he's worked in the Himalayas, Brazil, Mongolia, Vietnam, British Columbia, and I might be forgetting a few other places. He's been all over. So without further ado, please uh, help me welcome our first speaker, Dr. Peter, Peter Ross. Thanks, Jonathan. How's the sound on that microphone? Not too bad? Not too good? So thanks for your patience this evening. A little bit of a technical uh, glitch, as I understand it. Uh, and let me know if you can hear me or cannot hear me in the back. How's that sound? Sounds OK. So I'm going to spend about 25 minutes uh, talking to you about uh, my uh, last 25 years. Uh, so we'll see how I do on that. And then I'll hand the floor over to Hans and then uh, to questions. Um, and when we look at uh, the oceans today, of course, we have a lot of questions about uh, about what's going on. We have a lot of questions about uh, what state they're in and what, what threats some of the valued creatures that we see uh, on our doorsteps, uh, what, the, what they face in terms of um, conservation uh, threats. Um, and when we look at the ocean in British Columbia, of course, we're thinking uh, very quickly about our killer whales. And I've had the good fortune of, uh, of studying killer whales for some time. Um, not up close and personal, but often from a laboratory perspective and trying to figuring out figure out where the chemicals are coming from that we find in their bodies and what kinds of effects these chemicals might have on their health. But the ocean is simply not a sim uh, an easy place to work. Uh, the ocean is a very complex, uh, foreboding uh, place where humans just don't do very well. We need expensive technologies uh, to work on or in or under the ocean, the surface of the ocean. Uh, and for me, one of the great uh, wonders of, uh, of my career has been to partner with marine mammals because it's the marine mammals that are actually uh, my colleagues, my collaborators, the animals that are out there swimming around the ocean, sampling the food web and telling me, translating to me some of the priorities that, uh, that we should uh, have at the forefront of our agendas, whether it's uh, socioeconomic agendas or uh, environmental uh, stewardship agendas. Now, as you probably know, some uh, cetaceans and some marine mammals have gone extinct. Not very many, luckily, uh, at the hands of man, uh, but two notable exceptions. Uh, the stellar uh, sea lion, um, uh, sorry, the stellar sea cow, uh, pictured on the upper uh, left uh, uh, graphic, um, a, ra a very large animal. It's actually the, the mammal that went extinct uh, most quickly uh, from discovery to extinction. Uh, it was a matter of a, a couple of decades. Uh, the Baiji, uh, lower left, has gone extinct. That's the Yangtze River uh, dolphin. 
and uh, this animal uh, no longer exists. And that was another, uh, the first cetacean to go, first and only thus far uh, cetacean to go extinct at the hands of man. Uh, of course, our uh, transient and offshore and uh, resident killer whales face uh, countless threats. All, all of these populations are listed uh, to varying degrees under the terms of the Species at Risk Act uh, in Canada. The Taiwanese white dolphin that I spoke to uh, just a week ago, uh, only 74 individuals left in Taiwan, also facing uh, incredible threats uh, at the hands of man. Of course, we can't ignore the, the lingering uh, effects of past actions. Uh, industrial whaling depleted many of the large, uh, the great whale populations, uh, and uh, many of the great whales, that, say fin, uh, sperm, uh, blue whales, have had a, a great deal of trouble recovering uh, from the legacy of our industrial uh, whaling uh, era. And uh, so when we look at conservation, some of us think that whaling is a thing of the past, and yet we really continue to suffer uh, at the, at the, at our past, from our past mistakes. 1859, commercial oil, the era of commercial oil began in Titusville, Pennsylvania, uh, one year after oil was commercially uh, uh, taken out of the ground in uh, Petrolia, Ontario, less, less known story. But Titusville, Pennsylvania is the, uh, the, the founding uh, origin of uh, commercial uh, oil extraction. And this is Vanity Fair in 1861 where the the great whales were celebrating the discovery of commercial grade oil because uh, this was something that helped to take the pressure uh, off the, uh, the, whale, uh, the whaling uh, sector. Uh, oil from the ground then was used to light lanterns uh, and then uh, was used in steamships and eventually automobiles, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that was a good uh, news story for uh, the whales at the time, but of course we can't ignore climate change, even though I'm not going to speak much to CO2 and climate change tonight, we can't ignore uh, the, uh, the really catastrophic emergence of uh, increasing uh, carbon dioxide concentrations in our atmosphere and the implications for a warm. On this uh, graphic are three images. Uh, the top right is uh, the view through a dissecting microscope. That's a one millimeter or 1,000 micrometer band in the lower right. This is uh, sieved seawater from off the coast of British Columbia. All of those little particles of different colors are fibers and or particles of plastic uh, of unknown origin. The bottom left is a histogram from uh, Vancouver heading essentially around Vancouver Island and then out into a uh, uh, thousand kilometers offshore along uh, Line P out to Station Papa, a very famous 60-year-old uh, uh, transect that's been run for scientific study. And what we see are very high levels of the microplastic particles, the concentration of these bits uh, in seawater near uh, the Strait of Georgia and Queen Charlotte's uh, Sound, and then diminishing as we go offshore. Nonetheless, we found plastics all the way out to 1,000 uh, kilometers offshore. And in fact, the concentration of plastics in the Strait of Georgia averaged 4,000 particles per meter cubed of seawater. We don't know where these are coming from or what they're doing, but the concern is that there are a lot of little critters like uh, zooplankton, shellfish, larval fish, uh, that may be mistaking some of these bits for food and then suffering some of the, the, uh, the same kinds of catastrophic, life-threatening impacts as we see with, uh, with uh, seabirds and uh, marine mammals. And I'm not going to talk about sewage very much this evening uh, either. I'm trying to give you a little bit of a flavor of some of the issues that we, we are concerned about uh, in a general sense as I proceed through this talk. Um, but sewage has, of course, uh, um, uh, continued to evoke a lot of emotion here in Vancouver and Victoria and elsewhere. Uh, but sewage is uh, simply a, a, comes from the old English term seaward. Uh, where in the 1850s, as the city of London started to channelize its, uh, its, um, its uh, ditches and gutters and, and rivers uh, in order to collect human waste and send it off towards the sea, which was a very good thing when one is concerned about public health and cholera and typhoid and dysentery. Uh, it's a very good thing to, to get sewage uh, away from uh, domestic abodes of, of human beings. The problem is uh, twofold. Number one, we create a downstream uh, uh, series of risks or, or effects. 
Uh, and the second is that sewage today is not what it was in the 1850s. Sewage today contains literally tens of thousands of chemicals that we produce. We have one, over 100,000 chemicals on the Canadian marketplace. Uh, we have many other ones that are undocumented. And sewage, is, and sewage treatment is simply uh, a means of, of uh, trying to mitigate what's going down the drain, whether it's coming from some factories and municipal sources or, or household, largely household waste. But we have pharmaceuticals, we have nanotechnologies, we have soaps, detergents, uh, a lot of personal care products. We have a lot of cosmetics that have microplastics deliberately designed into the product. If you use facial scrub, uh, products from several companies or use toothpaste with abrasives, we are probably flushing millions, if not billions, if not trillions of little particles down uh, into the sewage system. And we're leaving up to the regional governments to pick up the pieces and try to design a means of removing all of the harmful products from sewage. It's a huge task to unload to the municipal taxpayer or the regional government. Um, and uh, certainly as we learn more, we, we, uh, we refine our means of understanding risk uh, and what the options are, whether it's best to go for source control, chemical regulation, or an engineering solution at the level of uh, city government or, or regional governments. I'm not going to talk very much tonight uh, about non-point sources of pollutants uh, when we look at fish habitat, streams, rivers. We look at the Fraser River. There's a large uh, article yesterday by Larry Penn at Vancouver Sun talking about Fraser River uh, salmon habitat uh, and talking about the impacts of agricultural practices uh, and other, uh, other human activities on salmon-bearing streams. If there's anything that's critical to resident killer whales, it's salmon-bearing streams. 92% of what the southern resident killer whales are eating is Chinook salmon. We have uh, largely regulated we generally acknowledge our, our a no no from a regulatory standpoint. We don't want chemicals designed that get out into the environment that are persistent, they're bioaccumulative, and they're toxic. So, PCBs, you've probably heard of, DDT, the organic chlorine pesticide, I'm sure you've heard of, dioxins, you've probably heard of as well. That's President, uh, former President Yushchenko from Ukraine, who's deliberately poisoned by a nearly fatal dose of 2378 tetrachlorodibenzo P dioxin. That's one of many dioxins that are, uh, uh, that are uh, out there in the real world. Dioxins are not um, engineered for any commercial application, though. PCBs were designed as heat-resistant uh, stabilizing oils, transformer oils. DDT was, a, was a, uh, a, uh, an organochlorine pesticide that was widely used. Uh, it led to eggshell thinning because it resembled estrogen and disrupted estrogen dynamics in seabirds. Uh, uh, and then, but dioxins, most of the dioxins in British Columbia either come from low temperature combustion, incineration, automobiles, forest fires, garbage dumps, uh, or pulp and paper mills. But this was discovered, this source, this big source of dioxins to the BC environment was discovered in the mid 1980s. Uh, and we now, and as of 1989, we had regulations dealing with uh, the emissions of dioxins, and we've seen a 95% decline in the release of dioxins from pulp and paper mills into coastal uh, waters of British Columbia. The reason marine mammals are such a wonderful uh, study uh, animal to me is because many of them occupy very high positions in uh, marine food webs. Uh, that is, they occupy high trophic levels. They're also long-lived, which means they have a, a long time to accumulate chemicals, uh, and they, they would tend to see these bioaccumulative contaminants increasing in concentration over the course of their lifetime, uh, because our livers, or the mammalian liver, has a great deal of difficulty eliminating these POPs. So POPs, persistent organic pollutants, uh, are essentially a class of chemicals that have three features. They're persistent, they're bioaccumulative, and they're toxic. They're not acutely toxic, but they're going to disrupt uh, the endocrine system in a lot of animals, uh, and uh, they can lead to developmental abnormalities, uh, effects on the reproductive system, effect, uh, effects on the development of the brain, effects on the development of the skeleton, effects on the development of the immune system. We've got lots of laboratory studies uh, that very clearly uh, illustrate uh, these, uh, these effects. And we've got a, a, a decent 
a variety of studies from wild animals where we see this, and the best evidence for the uh, effects of PBT chemicals uh, in wildlife are in the seabirds uh, and the marine mammals that are occupying high trophic levels because these chemicals get amplified in food webs. At each position in the food chain, you get increasing concentration because these animals are burning off fat within which we find these chemicals, they're fat-soluble chemicals, uh, and therefore in a reducing amount of fat, uh, we're seeing increasing concentrations of these chemicals. Uh, just to point out two chemical structures here, PCBs in the upper right, that's polychlorinated biphenyls, there are 209 different kinds, banned in 1977 in Canada, polybrominated diphenyl ethers, the second molecule here, uh, uh, PBDEs, you note very similar structures, uh, also 209 uh, theoretical different chemicals within this class of compound. PBDEs are, have just been phased out. PBDEs were very widely used as a flame retardant chemical in couches, textiles, electronics, the seats uh, uh, that you sit on that have polyurethane foam, and we're just getting them out of the, uh, the consumer uh, stream uh, as we speak. Uh, in the year 2000, we published a paper uh, showing uh, just how contaminated the northern and southern resident killer whales were in British Columbia and the transient killer whales. And we, we noted a few things. First of all, we were able to build on a wonderful photo ID catalog that predated my arrival here uh, and my work on killer whales. But colleagues of mine, John Ford, Graham Ellis, Lance Barrett Leonard, were able to collect biopsy samples from just under the dorsal fin from known individual animals. Very important. These are not stranded samples from emaciated uh, uh, animals that have been floating around. We got biopsies, 47 biopsies from live animals. We knew whether they're boy or girl. We, know, we knew how old they were, and we also knew what they ate. And that was key to interpreting uh, the PCB levels in these graphs. Boys are blue, girls are pink. So why are the boys so much more contaminated than the girls or vice versa? It's because the the, the females are able to offload these fat-soluble chemicals through their fat-rich milk and through their placenta to their, uh, their offspring. Um, and uh, killer whale milk is probably 35 to 40 percent fat, very rich, very, uh, very uh, good conduit for these chemicals to be offloaded uh, to, uh, to their offspring. So not very good for the developing calf that is now one step higher than his or her mother in the food chain. Uh, the males, on the other hand, they just get more and more uh, contaminated as they get older. Uh, and in fact, the uh, male transients at over, averaging over 250 parts per million are three to five times more contaminated than the belugas in the St. Lawrence estuary that prior to this study were thought to be the most contaminated marine mammals in the world. Why do we see differences between the northern and southern residents and the transients? Well, the first thing is the transients eat marine mammals and the residents eat fish, primarily salmon. So transients, one step higher in the food chain, they're very contaminated. Northern, southern residents, we don't know exactly why the re southern residents are more contaminated than northern residents, but it, suffice to say that there are some studies that, that would indicate that more southerly salmon populations and stocks are more contaminated than the more northern uh, stocks. What does this mean? Does it, do these PCBs at these levels present a risk? Well. Uh, using a similar uh, approach to obtaining biopsies from known individuals, we were able to uh, garner samples uh, in support of some genomic evaluation. This is basically looking at the health of killer whales uh, through uh, genomics techniques or, or polymerase chain reaction, whereby uh, we demonstrated that for five genes, five hormone receptors, uh, aryl hydrocarbon receptor, thyroid hormone receptor, estrogen receptor, interleukin-10, metallothionine, these five uh, uh, endpoints had a, a, a very significant and positive correlation with the concentration of PCBs on the lower uh, horizontal x-axis there. Uh, so this means we've got a direct relationship between the health of the animal and their exposure to PCBs, PCB being the dominant uh, POP in the tissues of these animals. So this is troubling at a physiological level, at a molecular level. We're not sure what it means in terms of uh, population level outcomes, such as reproduction or mortality or growth. But suffice to say that the, these animals are at increased risk of adverse health effects associated with these sorts of uh, physio physiological endpoints. 
Not easy to carry out toxicological research on a killer whale. A couple of other studies of a note here, where are these chemicals coming from? Because we want to know if they're causing a problem, we want to backtrack, figure out what the source is so that we can try to do something about it or understand what, why these animals are so, so uh, vulnerable. Uh, firstly, uh, Chinook salmon returning uh, from their time at sea are coming back uh, uh, laden with persistent organic pollutants that they've acquired dur during their time at sea. In fact, uh, a former PhD student of mine, uh, Donna Cohen, was able to demonstrate that about 98% of the PCBs and organochlorine pesticides in returning adult Chinook salmon were coming from their time at sea. So the salmon are delivering a, a Pacific-wide or a basically a global background uh, source of these persistent contaminants to, uh, to killer whales. Another study, another former PhD student of mine, Marie Noel, published this paper, these little spaghetti lines, the blue spaghetti lines. It's actually called the spaghetti plot. Uh, and we were able to, this was an air sampling study wherein uh, we, we were able to show uh, that uh, approximately 40% of some of the atmospherically derived contaminants, PBDEs in this case, uh, were coming from Asia. And it only takes five to 10 days for Asian air masses to get from mainland uh, Asia to our coastline. This is a very easy conduit for global pollutants uh, uh, to, to head right uh, our ocean and get in and then drop out through precipitation or dry deposition into the surface of water bodies and then of course these fat soluble chemicals they love fats they will get grabbed on at the bottom of the food chain and sucked up and amplified into uh, high trophic level predators uh, another PhD student of mine Jenny Christensen former uh, uh, student uh, she was able to demonstrate that the vast majority of organochlorine pesticides PCBs and PBDEs in coastal grizzly bears were coming from their consumption of salmon. That means that coastal grizzly bears that rely very heavily on salmon are, are essentially acquiring uh, these contaminants from what's happening in the Pacific Ocean at large. What's happening in our backyard? It's always fun to blame our neighbors across the other side of the world or across the, the dotted line to the south, but we always have to understand what we're contributing to this entire spectrum of stories. Uh, here we've got PCBs on the left uh, in harbor seals and PBDEs on the right, so PCBs in red, uh, and those bar uh, plots are simply uh, giving us the average PCB concentrations in seals from a number of different haul-out sites. These are live captured, four-week-old pups. They're all the same, no influence of sex uh, uh, or age, uh, etc. We find that uh, animals sampled down in South Puget Sound, uh, together with colleagues uh, Steve Jeffries at the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, have seven times higher PCB concentrations than any of their counterparts in the, anywhere in the Strait of Georgia. And this is probably partly due to the fact that uh, Puget Sound is a very vulnerable receiving environment. You'll hear this often when we look at liquid discharge permits and trying to figure out what we can release into a certain body of water. We want to know whether it's a pond, a lake, a big lake, a great lake, an estuary, a coastal zone. The, the nature of the receiving environment is going to dictate how sensitive it is to our uh, release of pollutants. And in this case, Puget Sound is a very uh, vulnerable receiving environment. You'll notice for PBDEs, these are from animals sampled in 2004, it's already getting just a little bit dated. Uh, there's less uh, variation across the sampling sites, probably because PCBs have been banned 30 years before and PBDEs were still in current use, such that you get a more ubiquitous uh, presence and uptake into the food web of PBDEs, whereas PCBs are starting to simply reflect the lingering hotspots, whereas the other uh, areas are getting buried and uh, rehabilitated. If we look at surficial sediments, we can also understand a little bit about source. This is PCBs on the left again and PBDEs on the right. These chemicals, fat soluble, have a choice to make. They're not gonna dissolve in water, so they're gonna either get taken up in the food web by binding to fats, or they're gonna bind to organic carbon and particulate and then sediment out. That's the latter that we kind of count on uh, because that will allow those chemicals to, over time, be buried. And burial is what we're looking for because the half-life of PCBs in the environment is in the hundreds of years. The only reason they're really dropping is not because they're breaking down and disappearing, it's because they're 
evaporating and heading up into the Arctic or they're getting buried in our sediments. So if we look at surficial, the surface layer of sediments, this is what we see. Clearly, you can see uh, the, uh, the Port of Vancouver and Victoria and actually the northern strait of Georgia, a bit of a hot zone for PCBs and PBDEs. But you'll also notice that for PBDEs, that hot zone extends uh, off uh, to the mouth of the Fraser River, probably reflecting the, 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 the uh, release of PBDs through sewage treatment uh, uh, streams, because PCBs were largely industrial chemicals, uh, whereas PBDEs were used in a wide variety of consumer applications. Uh, and the evidence would indicate that there are uh, very large quantities of PBDs still being released through our uh, domestic uh, house wa household waste uh, stream. The good news is that regulations can help. PCBs have dropped uh, in our environment. This is harbor seals at the top left, uh, dating back to 1984. You'll see about a five-fold drop from 1984 to uh, very recently. Uh, and, and in fact, before 1984, we have data going back to the early 1970s in Puget Sound, where the levels were uh, another four times higher than the highest levels you see here. So we've seen a steady uh, improvement if I can call it that, a de decrease in the concentration of PCBs and harbor seals at the top of the food chain. That's good news for the food web because these animals are sampling uh, 20, 25, 30 different species of, of pelagic fish and some invertebrates. They're integrating what's going on in the food web. Uh, and this means that simply banning a single chemical uh, and or dealing with its source will improve the health of our marine mammals over time. PBDEs despite the fact that they were virtually identical in structure and form to PCBs, uh, were allowed to continue in the marketplace because they were grandfathered in before we had legislation uh, on uh, persistent biocumulative uh, uh, and toxic chemicals uh, under SEPA. Uh, so PBDs were doubling every 3.2 years uh, from the early 1980s until about 2004. And end of 2004, just about the peak right here, uh, Canada and the U.S. enacted uh, either regulations or voluntary withdrawals on two of the three uh, commercial products, uh, commercial PBD products, uh, the ones that were most mobile and, and likely uh, most uh, problematic for food webs. And since then, we've got one data point that would indicate we've seen an improvement on, in, that, uh, uh, in, in the case of PBDs as well. So regulations for something like this really key at the national level uh, and, and beyond. So uh, I'm getting towards the end of my talk here just to, I guess, uh, emphasize the fact that often when we look at ocean pollution, we look at research, we look at monitoring, it can be expensive, it can be bad news. A lot of decision makers really don't like bad news. But when we monitor these stories in the ocean and we translate them in, in uh, support of uh, policy makers, uh, then, uh, then um, this can help to inform regulation, source control, or choices uh, that uh, society at large can, can, uh, can make. And as I hope I've illustrated tonight, we really have two uh, paradigms to capture here in terms of doing something uh, about that knowledge. If we're going to proceed into the future uh, and uh, act as, as true custodians for what's going on in our, in our oceans, we have to look at uh, ocean pollution in terms of what we are producing, what's in our backyard, what is derived, generated, uh, by produced, uh, or deliberately designed in our backyard, and that's the local uh, contribution or the local influence. And what we've got here in the left is the Salish Sea, 8 million people, 80 killer whales. That's an awful lot of people per killer whale, if you uh, do the math. And then, of course, on the right is the global uh, nature of the pollutants that we look at. The most contaminated human beings on the planet are the Inuit in Canada's north. Not because it's more polluted in the Arctic, but because they, they rely much more heavily on seafood than the average Canadian or the average consumer in North America. Uh, and the average Inuit, about 10 times more PCB contaminated than the average Southern Canadian, uh, which is a, a, a true uh, a testimony to uh, the way in which these chemicals uh, get around the world with impunity. And the good news in terms of at least the legacy contaminants and some of the emerging contaminants, if we have persistent bioaccumulative and toxic chemicals, then the Stockholm Convention, which was ratified into uh, international treaty form in 2004, 
It was an international treaty that Canada spearheaded. It was, uh, Canada was the first signatory to the Stockholm Convention, and it was largely Canadian science that created the impetus uh, in support of the Stockholm Convention. And this convention basically said, if you've got chemicals that are persistent, bioaccumulative, and toxic, they're going to end up traveling many thousands of kilometers, and they're going to contaminate, contaminate uh, the country foods or the traditional foods of Aboriginal uh, uh, parties, and that's, that's not a good thing. So most of these chemicals that are considered legacy con chemicals uh, ha have been interdicted, uh, and signatories to this uh, convention uh, undertake to uh, eliminate them uh, at a national level. And of course, science, what I'm talking to you about tonight, is only a tool to study the world around us. Science is not in the business of telling society what to do. Science is not in the business of creating regulations. It's society at large that has to turn around and, and try to figure out what to do with this news or with this information. Uh, and it's, it, you can go on the internet and find out all of the wonderful groups in the Lower Fraser uh, Valley, uh, across the board in Washington State, uh, or internationally. They're dealing with different aspects of non-point source pollution or point source pollution, as well as individual house owner uh, responsibilities if you're going to be a good good shopper. Uh, you have a killer whale friendly lawn without pesticides. You're going to uh, not purchase, uh, the, I like this, this iPhone app here, Beat the Microbead, which will identify for you all the cosmetics when you scan, use your iPhone to scan uh, the barcode uh, at the drugstore or the supermarket. You can figure out which products have microbeads in them uh, and you can be a wise consumer. It doesn't uh, negate the need for national regulations or international treaties, but I always argue that we all have to work together on these things. Anyway, thanks very much for your time. Uh, that's me. I'm going to hand the floor over to Hans Schreier to uh, hopefully build on the, the ladder, and that is uh, to uh, pinpoint some of the sources with regard to water pollution issues around BC uh, in uh, celebration of uh, Ocean's Day. Good evening. So I'm going to tell you a little bit where all these contaminants come from and then hopefully end with a more positive note showing what we can actually do about them. This is my horrendogram. <laughs> it's basically showing you how complicated it is to manage urban water. We have stormwater, we have domestic wastewater, we have industrial discharge, accidental spills, solid waste, we have atmospheric pollution which returns to the water, and we have water supply problems. All of these things contribute to the urban runoff. And you can see below in brown all these different type of contaminants which are generated by the urban environment. So where is the sewage going to? In Vancouver, we have a number of sewage treatment plants, and most of the stuff we do is primary and secondary treatment. What does that mean? We aerate, and we get rid of the sediment. And whatever is soluble is actually released. So now you know Victoria has no sewage treatment plant, and now they're building one, but they're not going to go to tertiary treatment, which is taking out some of these contaminants. Similarly. Lionsgate treatment plant is a very old and decrepit one like me, and they have to upgrade it. And also, they're not going to tertiary treatment because the public said it's too expensive. They're going to spend $700 million for secondary treatment, and it will be another $300 million to get to tertiary treatment. Now, we don't seem to have the foresight about dealing with this. So I just looked at my water bill today, and you can see my water bill is $546 per year, and the sewage bill is 297 Now, to treat your water is so much easier because you already start with a clean water. <laughs> the, the sewage is so much more complicated because there's so many more contaminants in it. And you can see Metro Vancouver spends relatively little on sewage compared to drinking water. So society has actually decided that 
Drinking water is the most important thing because we get very sick very quickly, but the rest is the best solution to pollution is dilution. And this has to change. So not only do we have a lot of sewage problems which go directly into the receiving water, but we also have a lot of what I call non-point source pollution in the urban environment. So if you make your city impervious, you pave everything, and if you have diligent graduate students who don't cost very much, they can actually digitize the whole city and tell you how much impervious surface we have. And when you do that, you change the way the pollutants get into the river. So let me show you this graph. The blue is the amount of rainfall which evapotranspires. The red is the amount of rainfall which runs over the surface into the receiving water. The yellow is the amount of rainfall which goes into soils, and the blue is what goes into groundwater. So on the left-hand side, you see how the rainfall is distributed in a forest. And if we then move all the way to the right, this is urbanization, which means we are generating massive amounts of surface runoff, so whatever accumulates at the surface is going to go into your water. So if you look at this after a rainfall, this is the hydrograph. In other words, this is how the river responds after a rain event. The blue line is in a forested environment. The peak uh, green line is what happens in an urban environment where everything is impervious. That means, first of all, the peak flow is going to come very, very fast. And secondly, the peak flow is going to be much, much higher than in a forested system because everything runs over the surface, which means it's much more erodible, which means the pollutants get into the water faster and more of them go. So if we now would like to have a lot of aquatic organisms in our watershed in the urban environment, we have this very interesting observation where the bottom line is how much impervious surface do we have and the other axis is what is the biodiversity of the aquatic organisms. And when, if you look at this, you can see that right, way up there, sorry. Way up there, you have very high biodiversity. And as we go more and more impervious, you can see, see that obviously you're going to use all your biodiversity. And the interesting thing is Vancouver is at about 45, 50% impervious. And so you can now say, well, if we rip off pavement, we could actually go back a little bit. But you can see that has virtually no impact whatsoever on biodiversity. So what we actually should be doing is we should build cities with less than 15% imperviousness if we want to have biodiversity. So what do we do with urban stormwater? You don't want to drive on a highway with flooded water. I was working in the city of Sao Paulo, and you can see on this picture, they built a whole river in a canyon. And on both sides of the river is the freeway. And whenever we have a big rainstorm, the water comes up onto the freeway, and you're stuck for 24 hours in water until it recedes. And 30% of that water is sewage. So you can imagine what kind of an experience that is. I can talk from personal experience. It's not very pleasant. So what we have been doing, the engineers can solve problems for you. And we have decided as a society, we're going to put everything in pipes and direct it into the rivers as fast as possible because you don't want flooding. <clears throat> so have you ever looked at a parking lot? Look at these kind of where your engine is parked. And this accumulates over a dry period. And then as soon as you get a rainfall event, all of these different contaminants get washed into the aquatic system. In terms of pathogens, we have so many new pathogens to deal with. And most of them, we don't know very much about it. So that's even another problem, which comes also from the urban environment. So how bad is the pollution? in an urban environment. You probably all know Burnaby, and you know Burnaby Lake in the middle. So Burnaby Lake is in the middle of a watershed, which is completely urbanized, which means every year when we have the peak 
rainfall season, sediments get deposited into the lake. And over time, the lake has been silting in. And now, in the summer, there's only about a foot of water. And people like to, use, to do rowing in there. And now the big challenge is, well, we should probably dredge it because it's getting silted in. But now you have to consider what is actually in these sediments. So what we can actually do is we can core the lake and get every year we get a layer. And we can use isotopes to determine how old these sediments are. And then we measure the concentration of the pollutants. So if you look at the bottom here, 1830 is the oldest we were able to get. And in terms of lead, you can see we had virtually no lead until about 1900, when the first settlers came in. And the first thing they did is they burned the forest. So we had a little bit of lead coming out of burning. And then the cars came in, and you can see massive increases in lead until about 1980, when we took lead out of gasoline. And then, because source control, you can see the sediments are getting better. But if you look at zinc, the whole thing is still going up because we have no source control for zinc. But what is even more interesting is, if you look at what is in these sediments in the 50s and 60s, you can actually see there's PCBs and DDTs in these sediments. So if we now think about all the places where we don't have a lake, where everything goes directly into the ocean, that's where the pollution is going. And now they want to dredge the lake. And of course, now we have to start dealing with these chemicals if we don't want to release them into the ocean. <coughs> so if you look at the whole sediment con consideration, the yellow in the top one is the lead in 73. And the red is the lead in 93 in the sediment. And you can see over that time period, because we took the lead out, we improved the conditions dramatically. However, what did we replace lead with? Manganese, MMX, non octing uh, uh, compound. And if you look at the bottom, so we have now all of a sudden between 73 and 93, we have much, much more manganese problems than we had before. So again, fortunately, manganese is not as toxic as lead. But nevertheless, whatever we do, there is a problem. So urbanization is happening incredibly fast. And the, the left-hand side here shows you a picture of Coquitlam in 84, is in 95. So 11-year period, we went from a forest in dark to a complete urbanized environment, massive amounts of impervious surface, lots of stuff running into rivers. Everybody likes big houses. I don't know why everybody wants these big mansions. But what is interesting is you can see what happens when you convert a house into a subdivision. We go from about 23% imperviousness to 54% imperviousness. That means all the runoff is going to go into rivers. What do we do in a city now? Densification. So now we build all these coach houses. And so the new bylaw says the old regulation was 65% of your property can be developed. And now, because of the coach house, it's 72. So we're creating more and more of these runoff problems, which contribute to all the pollution which goes into the waterway. So now that I have completely depressed you, I'd like to take a more positive approach and say, let's think about how we could actually change this. The very first thing we should think about is, we need to start treating our sewage in a much different way than we have ever before. And that takes money. But if we want to have fish in the urban environment, salmon in the city, we need to start addressing that. The second one is the urban stormwater runoff. And remember, traditionally, when you move into a city, you expect the city to do everything for you, including garbage collection, wastewater treatment, drinking water, everything is taken care of. And you just sit back and hope they do a good job. And what we're now saying is, you as an individual landowner has a responsibility to start improving the pollution runoff from your property. So in the past, in blue, at the property scale, we drained and removed. Nobody wants water in their basement. So pipe it as fast as possible 
all the roof water goes into the sewage pipe, all the dr driveways go into the pipe, and so on. What we're now saying, 180 degree shift, we say you should retain your rain on your property, and we sh I'll show you what we can do with it. And then we move to a larger scale, like the neighborhood scale. And at the neighborhood scale, you're going to deal with roads and parking lots. And again, the traditional approach has been drain and remove, pipe everything. Now what we're saying is, why don't we start storing and delaying the runoff and try to clean it up? And then at the watershed scale is where you get the cumulative effect, where everybody is actually combining all the impacts, and there we usually build structure to protect you from flooding, but what you're now saying is maybe we should delay that runoff, create better buffer zones, and have a completely new way of dealing with stormwater. So what can you actually do as an individual to reduce your pollution runoff and the amount of water which goes into your aquatic system? Well, at your property, you could actually have a green roof which reduces all kinds of air pollution. You could harvest your roof water and use it for outdoor use. Vancouver uses about 40% of the purified bacterial-free drinking water to water your lawn. That's a pretty stupid way of dealing with expensive water. Why not collect your roof water and use it for outdoor purposes? You save a lot of money and it's good for the environment. Minimize your impervious surfaces. I'll show you some examples. Pervious pavement is around. That allows the rainfall to infiltrate. The pollutants get into the soil. The soil can do all kinds of breakdowns and slowly filters the water into the stream without all the contaminants. Topsoil is another uh, issue, which I'll show you in a minute. Urban trees can do a wonderful job, and creating rain garden is a very effective way of dealing with the, all the kind of problems with rainfall and pollution at the property scale. When we then move at, to the neighborhood, then we have to deal with roads. And we need to completely redesign the way we do roads with no curbs, no gutters, and no pipes. Swales to infiltrate the runoff from the roads and from the parking lots detention ponds, wetlands, and that kind of stuff. And then at the watershed scale, we need much larger buffer zone on both sides of the river so that we can actually absorb all the sediments and everything before it goes into the river system. And we need a totally new approach to stormwater management. So at the property scale, this is a, a picture of the Mountain Equipment Co-op Center, which is built in North Vancouver. They actually collect their roof water and put it into a swale. It infiltrates, and then they have a groundwater uh, well, and they pipe that, they pump that water into their collection tank and use it to flush their toilets. We use massive amounts of water for flushing toilets. The standard flushing is 21 liters per person per day. And I go about seven times. And if you get older, you go more often. And now we have these two, three, and six liter systems. So think how much water you could save on a day, on a, a day if you go from 21 liters seven times to three and six liters. It's about 150 liters per person per day. This is a massive savings and also will reduce the amount of water the treatment people have to deal with. So green roofs is a good way to do it. We can use it for infiltration as well as for other things. Roof water harvesting can be done for all kinds of things. In fact, uh, Bowen Island now has a bylaw that people on Bowen Island are no longer allowed to use drinking water for outdoor purposes. So they have to collect the roof water for that purpose. And some of them have even gone further and they use that rainwater to flush the toilets. How many of you like to cut your lawn? This is the most ridiculous thing because everybody wants a green lawn. Then you have to irrigate and fertilize and you have to cut it every three weeks. Well, we now discovered that if you, what is the very first thing you do when you build a new house? You remove the topsoil. And then you bring in the bulldozer, you compact all the soil. 
And what's the very last thing you do before the real estate agent comes? You roll out the turf. That's about an inch of soil. We now know that if we will put 30 centimeters of topsoil before you put the lawn on, your irrigation requirements will go down by at least 30%. And then it allows all these contaminants to infiltrate, and the organisms in the soil can break down all kinds of things, including hydrocarbons. Trees. Trees are incredibly interesting things. We know that in a forest, about 25 to 30 percent of the rain gets evapotranspired. But urban trees are very different. Urban trees have much higher temperatures, the wind can blow through, but we had no idea how much water is actually evapotranspired by urban trees. So we did a study where we put all these crazy interceptors on the 58 trees in North Vancouver, and we had a student measuring for one year period, how much rain is actually evapotranspired in the urban environment. And lo and behold, some of these trees can evapotranspire up to 66% of all the rainfall. That means you're going to have less problems going into your stormwater piping system. And not only do they reduce the amount of water, but the water which goes through the trees gets delayed, so your peak flow is going to be delayed as well. Just an example on how effective trees are in terms of water interception and snow interception. This is obviously a good example to show you. So everybody in the urban environment, when they can, should have a tree because this way you should be able to get carbon credit. It will cool your summer temperatures and is excellent for stormwater management. <clears throat> everybody likes to pave everything. And I had to go all the way to Bolivia to find something like this. Now look at where your engine is parked. Right in the middle is grass. That means all the oil and grease and the, all the hydrocarbons get into the soil, and they get filtered out in most cases before it gets into the receiving environment. Now we get a bigger challenge, and that's at the neighborhood scales, because we now have to deal with roads and parking lots. So, Typically what we do in residential areas, we build big roads and everybody has a driveway and I never know why we need these big roads. And what we now should be doing is something like this where all the runoff goes into swales or you have the lower left hand picture <coughs> or the right hand picture shows you a road with no curbs and no gutters and no pipes. All the runoff goes into a sand filter and gets slowed down. The pollution and the sediments accumulate, and then you don't have so many problems. This is how they built this kind of thing. Sam Steam, that's Sam Steam's playground for his master thesis. So they, in Silver Ridge, they have made these compartments. They then fill them with sand and gravel. All the runoff goes into these swales, and then they don't have a lot of grass. So there's always water running, so you can have actually quite a nice environment. And this is what it looks like five, six years later. It can be a very, very attractive feature and does wonderful things to pollution reduction. Parking lots are a terrible place because remember, if you have 10 or 20 days with no rain and then you get a rainfall, the first five or 10 minutes of that runoff is is incredibly contaminated. And this is so detrimental to the aquatic environment because it comes in a very high concentration over a very short period of time. And I think that's more detrimental than having slow increases in pollution. So what do we do in parking lots? Well, we can do something like this. This is in North Vancouver, where you can actually have all this stuff delayed and infiltrated and improved. Wetlands. All this history has told us that wetlands are the most incredible filter system and water storage system. They can actually accumulate and absorb and modify all kinds of pollutants, including pathogens. But wetlands have a very bad reputation. If you read the literature from Scotland and places like that, wetlands are bad because people disappear, they smell, you can't drive through it, and it's a horrible place. Yet, it's the best thing we have, far better than any of the natural, uh, the artificial system, to filter and drain a 
to filter and store water and improve the conditions. Whenever you introduce a wetland idea into the urban environment, the first thing you get is we don't want mosquitoes and we don't want uh, Nile virus. And the idea behind it is, yeah, we can actually reduce this very dramatically. And what we can do is, first of all, make sure that your wetland is never sitting there with stagnant water. Always have a little bit of movement going on. So you could put in a wind system or a solar panel to make sure the water is always circulating a bit. You can minimize the eutrophication that simply if you have too many nutrients, you have blue-green algae growing, you can actually reduce that dramatically. Mosquitoes like blue-green algae. If you don't have it, you can filter it out. You can plant a whole variety of plants, and they can actually be very antagonistic to mosquitoes. You can make sure that the plants have open space so the UV light goes through. That reduces the mosquitoes. And then you can introduce some fish, like stickleback, who can actually tolerate some really bad conditions. And they eat a lot of the larvae. And you can also go with some biological features. <clears throat> And that gets me now to the watershed scale, and that's where all the flooding comes in. And so what we're now saying is, this is what we have been doing in the past. You can see right here, you can see they had a flood, so they built up the, the, the wall. And then they had a flood again, they built it up again, and then they built up the wall a little bit higher. And now you're at the point where it's almost becoming a Berlin wall. So, this is the most stupidest way of dealing with urban water because all you're doing is you're making the water accelerate faster, moving all this stuff through much faster. So what we're saying is big buffer zones can actually do a lot because you can absorb the sediments, you can absorb the nutrients before it gets into the buffer zone, and you can build these wetlands into the buffer zone. So here's an example of a 30-meter buffer zone, which is now the regulation but we are arguing that you should have at least 60 to 100 meter buffer zones if you really want to protect the, the stream and the aquatic organisms. And that gets me to an interesting new situation. Rather than building all these expensive dikes and structures to pre protect people from flooding, why don't we start designating certain topographic areas where we can actually detain and store the water temporarily for a couple of days or three or four days and release it slowly. This can be done in golf courses, and the golf guys really like me, you can tell. <laughs> and you can actually do it in parks, and you can do it in agricultural land. And the damage is minimal, and you can compensate the owners, and that's far cheaper than building these very expensive systems. So. Let's go back one step and what you as an individual can do. So here's an example of an old house was converted into a new house. Whoops. It changed the impervious surfaces dramatically. And now what we are doing is we're saying if we would actually go to all these innovative things at the property scale, we could actually minimize the impact on the urban environment dramatically. Now, this is all what is happening, but now we need to also be aware of increased climatic variability. And I want you to really think about this because we have made a huge mistake by telling the public that it's going to get two to three degrees warmer on average. Average means absolutely nothing because when are you worried about climate? When it's too hot or too cold or too wet or too dry, that's when you worry about it. And we design urban stormwater usually on a 100-year return period. So what I'm showing you here is what happened in Caslow. We have a 100-year uh, precipitation information. And you can see in 1963, we had the highest peak flow. So all the stormwater was designed for 1963 type of runoff. And look at what happened in 2005, 2012, and 2013. The 2004 was almost double from what we ever had in history. And so most of the stormwater systems which we have in the urban environment are no longer adequate to deal with these new storms. 
And that's why we have to really come about with new ideas of innovative stormwater management. So here's the example of the individual houses. And here is what we actually can accomplish by doing all this low impact design. If you look at your left hand side, this is the amount of water which would run off from your property before it was developed when it was under natural conditions. Then the old house was 41% impervious, the new house 55%, so the runoff is increasing. So if we would do all of these innovations, you could actually re de decrease the runoff below what was there naturally because we're helping the soil, we're doing all kinds of wonderful things. So there is an opportunity coming which we can't miss. What I'm showing you here is the age of the houses in the district of North Vancouver. They were all built in about 1960 to 70. And the, the lifetime of a house in our part of the world is about 50 years or so. And these houses are becoming all decrepit and old. And now in about 2020, all of these are going to be replaced. And here is now a fantastic opportunity to bring in innovations. And unfortunately, Metro Vancouver is incredibly conservative. I cycle to work every day, and there are 50 houses under construction. There's not a single one which is doing anything innovative. So we need to bring these new ideas in before the big change in housing comes in, because that's when it pays off to do the things. So, what we need is we need very innovative stormwater management because we have rapid increases in population growth. As Vancouver is supposed to double population in the next 30 years. We have rapid densification. We have increased climatic variability. And if we want to protect the urban streams, we need pollution control and flooding control. Now, we just recently went around to look at all the innovators and we produced a video, which is now on YouTube. And you can actually visit that one, and all the red dots which you see are, are all the places where they do all these kind of innovative things. And if you click on each one of these dots, it will go directly to the video and shows you exactly what people have been doing. So if you're interested, go to this website and uh, you can see what some of the innovators are doing. And the biggest challenge for us is how can we get innovation into mainstream? Thank you very much. All right, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shire and Dr. Peter Ross. I'd like to go ahead and invite our speakers to both uh, come on up here and take a few questions. And uh, we're gonna just change the lighting. Uh, if we could change the lights to the main, the main lights and turn off the, the podium lights, please. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for just a few questions, and then we can go out and um, you can talk with our speakers one-on-one -on -one if you'd like for a few minutes. So I'd actually like to open it up. Uh, we had an online question from our YouTube audience uh, uh, for Dr. Peter Ross uh, from Osmia. Uh, you had mentioned a DDT, Dr. Ross. Are today's pesticides, herbicides, or fertilizers being proactively tested for persistent organic pollutants? Right. Uh, thank you. Is that mic on there? It is. You want to use it? It is. Is mine working? Hello? I think it's working. Okay. Uh, I think the question was, uh, I, I mentioned uh, DDT, uh, which was banned in Canada in 1976. That uh, was a very problematic uh, organic chlorine pesticide. Uh, under the terms of Canadian law now, chemicals that are deemed to be persistent, biocumulative and toxic, those three features together, are not supposed to be entering uh, the marketplace. Um, there are some chemicals, however, that are still persistent, but maybe don't bioaccumulate or maybe are not toxic. Uh, so there are, there are still some chemicals uh, of concern <coughs> in the marketplace. We have about 500 uh, pesticides on the Canadian marketplace uh, right now. Um, many of these are less persistent because of that big shift in paradigms for designing chemicals uh, in, uh, in, the, in the world, really. Uh, so we've seen chemicals uh, become less fat soluble, less persistent, and now we have more pesticides that are more water soluble, uh, but they also break down. The problem with that is that uh, they're still toxic, 
but they're more mobile. They end up getting into rivers, they're, they're more mobile, they're, uh, they may create uh, significant problems for invertebrates or fish uh, that are dealing with osmoregulation or smell, uh, et cetera, in the environment. Um, uh, and we often don't know what these chemicals break down to, so it's not necessarily a good thing if something breaks down. A good case in point is the old DDT that uh, it wasn't the parent, the original commercial product that was estrogenic uh, and created all the problems for, for seabirds. It was the breakdown product. The breakdown product was 20 times more estrogenic than the parent product. So uh, we are doing some things better. We've learned uh, about the big mistake uh, that we made as a society in terms of persistent chemicals. Uh, nonetheless, we still have some old persistent chemicals on the marketplace. Uh, they're slowly getting reviewed uh, and will presumably slowly get moved off the marketplace. Unfortunately, uh, we've created uh, impetus in the direction of many of these other chemicals uh, that have different features that may nonetheless uh, create problems for, for some uh, creatures out there. So I think we could probably do, we could probably stand to benefit from being more innovative with regard to uh, designing pesticides if we're going to resort to pesticides in the first place. Okay, can I go ahead and take a question from the audience and I'll bring the microphone up to you. Okay, great. Hi, Dr. Ross. I had a question in regards to, uh, is it PCBE? PBDEs? Or, okay. Uh, your maps showed Burrard Inlet had high concentra concentrations, and uh, one map said it was urban, originated from urban use. Okay. I, I yeah. live in North Van. I, I don't really see that. I was just wondering if it was related perhaps to all the tankers that go through Broad Inlet. I know that uh, Kinder Morgan has the, um, the fuel there, but the tankers itself, perhaps? I'm not sure. Could yeah. you extrapolate? Sure. So uh, PBDs are a flame retardant chemical. Uh, they're overwhelmingly used as flame retardant chemicals in consumer products, household uh, goods, uh, textiles, furnishings, polyurethane, foam was a big one. Uh, elect consumer electronics, automobiles, aircraft, trains, anything where you had a uh, risk of fire. Um, so PPDs largely being banned, but they're, they're persistent, number one. But also, let's say we ban PPDEs, but you bought a couch uh, somewhere at some superstore, furniture superstore, five years ago or, or eight years ago, chances are you haven't gotten rid of it. It's, it's still in your house. So when you're vacuuming, when you're sh rug shampooing, when you're putting laundry in from the curtains or the, or the textiles that may have some of these chemicals in, you're, you're essentially releasing those into the sewage streams. That's one problem. The other problem is we may have banned PBDEs in Canada, but we haven't told everybody in this room what to do with your mattress or your couch or your old computer at the end of the day. So they're going off the landfill. They're getting recycled if we're lucky, but unfortunately the recycling system for a lot of these products is very poor. But if they're going off the landfill, then we get what's called landfill leachate, which is all the chemicals oozing out, uh, going down through uh, into either groundwater or off into uh, a, a leachate uh, system. Uh, with PBDs, uh, uh, what we're seeing is we're seeing high concentrations in sediments and in animals and creatures uh, near sewage effluent or near urban uh, uh, areas. So it's it's most likely largely related to the, uh, the sewage treatment uh, effluent stream. And so the uh, so flip side of your question was, was shipping uh, PBDEs uh, not coming from those vessels. In the old days, tributyl tin, organotins, was used as an antifoulant on ship hulls. Uh, that's been largely eliminated ex except for military vessels. Uh, and now we're going back to copper and some other, uh, some other chemicals. So antifoulants on ships is a big problem. Oil. Uh, is another problem, of course, uh, through ballast and or uh, the threat of spill. So hydrocarbons or oils, yes, a big concern. Do we have any other questions from our audience? Okay, we'll take one last question and then we'll go out to the gallery and talk a little bit more. So just a quick question, Dr. Ross. Um, at the top of your presentation, you talked about a lot of different uh, concerns for marine mammals, but then you focused on the, um, the pops. Is that just because that's what your research was focused on, or in terms of um, 
what are like the greatest concerns for the mammals? Is that the top priority or? Excellent question. I, I, I probably speak to what I know most about. And uh, so the, the, the interesting thing is that we've seen significant improvements in a lot of the chemicals that I was certainly over my, uh, my career most concerned about. The persistent chemicals are the ones that amplify in food webs. Now PBDEs, uh, we're still seeing emerging. We're still seeing problems uh, increasing in, in some, uh, some areas. They are persistent chemicals. Uh, they're largely still in the marketplace. They're just getting phased out, et cetera. And there are a number of other chemicals, replacement chemicals for PBDEs. Every time we ban one, we replace them with something else. And unfortunately, with, with uh, the, the fire retardant, uh, uh, society's approach to fire retardants is we always want to make something that is persistent, that doesn't break down. Unfortunately, it's those features that are problematic in the food web. So if I look at emerging threats to marine mammals, I'd probably uh, uh, sort of generally categorize them as, as some of the new and emerging persistent contaminants of concern, many of which we know very little about. Uh, and then on the flip side, uh, some other chemicals that may not be as persistent or bioaccumulative, but may be a significant threat to their food supply. So these agricultural pesticides that are not as persistent, they may be knocking out uh, salmon streams here and there, altering development and growth in salmonids, et cetera. So those chemicals, we may not detect them in marine mammals at the top of the food chain, but they, they nonetheless may be impacting uh, their health through indirect means. But many, as I say, 100,000 chemicals in the market, it's hard to sort of uh, capture but it simplistically. The other concern are the antibiotics because agriculture uses far more antibiotics than we do for humans. And most of it ends up into the water system. The lifetime of these are relatively short, but they can actually do quite a lot damage on the food chain. And this is an area which significant research is going on right now. Okay, and I want to go ahead and ask a question myself and then we'll head out into the gallery. And this is for Dr. Hans Schreier. Uh, so cities like Vancouver want to be the greenest city, um, but we're also increasing our density. We talked a little bit about that in your presentation. So what is your one message for planners and policymakers? How do we get to being the greener or greenest cities if we're also saying that we need to increase our density? Well, our mayor wants to have the greenest city in the world, and he's totally preoccupied with bicycle lanes. I think he should probably pay much more attention to the way we use water and wastewater. Because if you think about it, we are the second biggest water consumers and we don't really deal with the wastewater. Half of the city is still in combined sewers and they are going to spend two billion dollars over the next 30 years to separate them. Well. 30 years is a long time to separate that, and in the meantime, every time we have a flood, all this stuff goes into the aquatic environment. So maybe the time has come to wake up and say, well, priorities should be maybe more on the wastewater treatment end. And uh, I would very much encourage you to look at your bill. Remember, you pay very, very little for your water and much less for your wastewater, and I bet with you your cell phone bill is somewhere between $600 and $1,000 a year, and your wastewater bill is 250 bucks. So where's the priority? <laughs> oh, you know what, if we can wait till we go out into the audience, that'd be great. Thank you very much. So good night, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, our next public program is going to be on June 23rd. It's about rescuing sea lions here on the BC coast. Uh, presentation with our own uh, veterinarian, Dr. Martin Howlena. Uh, thanks for coming. Happy World Oceans Day. Uh, take care. Good night.